Hello there, and welcome back. You are watching Drinking About Birds, the show where we drink and talk about birds. My name is Zach, and today we have this rosé from Natura, which is a Chilean producer, and it's decorated with a couple of species, actually. Uh, these are not the same bird. The lower one is a Eurasian blue tit. Uh, the upper one we don't actually know. It could be a number of different species. Uh, they're all in the genus Poecile. Some of these are called tits, others are called chickadees. It depends what side of the Atlantic that you're on. Bird ID is very geography dependent. So before you can really identify a species of bird, you have to know where you are and generally what birds are found there. So every species of bird has an expected range where you can expect to find them. And if you're outside that range, it's still possible, but it's much less likely. And that especially applies to uh, trying to ID a bird based on field marks, because you have to know the set of species that are likely to occur in your area before you can narrow them down using field marks. Because if you're looking at a hawk and it has a red tail in North America, it's probably a red-tailed hawk, but if you're in the UK, they don't have red-tailed hawks, so it could be a red kite or something else. So you really have to be aware of where you are. Both of these species are songbirds, and that is a term that you're going to hear quite a lot, and so I think it's worth taking some time to unpack it. That requires us to go into avian taxonomy a little bit. Now avian taxonomy at the nitty-gritty level is Byzantine, it's always changing, there's a lot of contentious debate around, you know, which species belong in which genus or which family. Um, it's really not worth sweating the details for most people, I don't think, but if you get a good idea of sort of the broad strokes of avian taxonomy, I think that's valuable. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on it. So birds are vertebrates of the class Aves. Aves just means birds in various languages, but especially Latin. Within birds, most of the higher level divisions are orders, and orders are named in the format blank forms. Some of these are kind of easy to figure out, like pelicaniforms. Others are a little trickier, like finicopteriforms, but um, that's the general format. And one of these orders is worth paying particular attention to because it's very important, and that is passerforms. Uh, these are also known as passerine birds, but passer forms roughly means sparrow-shaped. And these are colloquially known as songbirds, that's kind of a loose grouping. More properly, you can refer to them as perching birds, and that refers to an anatomical trait that's shared by members of this order. They have a tendon running down the back of their leg, and that tendon causes the toes to tighten when weight is placed on the leg. And what that allows them to do is sleep in trees without falling off of their little perch. Most birds are able to fly, and that's a huge survival advantage as long as they keep their wits about them because it means they can escape from predators. But birds still have to sleep. And when they sleep, they are potentially vulnerable. But because they have this adaptation where they can sleep on tree branches without falling off, that gives them an extra leg up in terms of survival. It's thought that this group of birds originated about 47 million years ago in what is now Australia, uh, and from there they radiated out and they colonized every other continent except Antarctica, and they became extremely diverse, and so now they make up the bulk of living birds. There are about 10,700 species of birds that have been formally described scientifically. About 6,500 of those are in passer forms. They are hugely diverse and they are quite varied in terms of habitat, lifestyle, diet, uh, nesting, behavior, plumage, just all sorts of diversity within this group. The term songbird is a little bit of a misnomer. So there's a subgroup within passerines called ocine passerines, and those are birds that have an especially highly developed syrinx, and so they are capable of producing much more complex and, to our ears, melodious songs than birds outside of this group. Birds make all kinds of different 
sounds, vocalizations, and otherwise. Uh, and so it's worth distinguishing between songs and calls. So songs are so called because they serve a sexual or territorial function. So it's typically a bird that is either advertising for a mate or declaring its ownership over a particular territory. And those things go hand in hand because when birds are evaluating potential mates, they look at the qualities of the individual, but they also look at the quality of the territory that it supposedly holds. So uh, birds will sing to attract a mate and to declare their ownership over a territory. And once they have attracted a mate and the territory is established, uh, they will keep singing to kind of maintain it. Calls are pretty much any vocalization that doesn't qualify as a song, so that's a much broader category. Ocene passerines uh, will have the most complex and interesting songs among birds, but not all of them have interesting songs. There are about 140 families within passeriforms, one of those families is Paridae. There are about 63 species worldwide. They're pretty widely distributed between North America, Europe, Asia, and Africa. They do not occur in South America, including in Chile, where this wine is from, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and they don't really occur in Australasia so much. But yeah, anywhere else you will find members of this family. They are typically forest-dwelling birds. Most of them are non-migratory, or they're very short-distance migrants. They are sexually monomorphic, like the red tails that we talked about last time. Uh, they are cavity nesters, which means they don't build a nest out of like sticks or leaves, or cattails or reeds or whatever. Uh, they find a cavity that's generally a hole in the side of a tree, uh, whether a naturally occurring cavity or something that's been excavated beforehand by a species like a woodpecker. Uh, and they will build a nest in there. They will uh, typically line it with like moss or other soft materials that they can gather from uh, nearby. Uh, but they will nest in a cavity and if there are not trees available, uh, some of these species nest in kind of desert. Uh, they can potentially use burrows in the ground as well, but most of them are forest dwelling. Visually, they tend to be kind of stout little birds. They don't have much of a neck, uh, and so their head is just kind of perched atop their body. They tend to have a short, sharp, uh, kind of stout bill, uh, and that's partly due to their feeding preferences. So most of these birds are insectivores a lot of the time. Um, they're not like flycatchers. They're not going after flying insects so much as they're finding like little worms and caterpillars that are crawling around in trees. Um, that's a behavior known as gleaning, which is a word I love. Um, but a lot of them live in <clears throat> uh, kind of colder climates, and because they are non-migratory, when insects are not super available, they have to be able to switch to other food sources. And so in that instance, they will switch over to eating mostly kind of seeds or buds or fruits, uh, whatever's available in winter time. And many of them will cache food. Uh, during the fall so that they have kind of more of a supply during the winter. They are kind of charming little birds. Um, they're a lot of fun to watch. Um, they tend to occur in flocks, uh, including mixed species flocks where um, you just have a bunch of birds that are dependent on similar food sources. Even if they're not the same species, they'll just kind of move through an area and pick over whatever's in the bushes. Depending where you are in the U.S., you might have mountain chickadees, chestnut-backed chickadees, um, Carolina chickadees are pretty common in the southeast, uh, and then titmice in the eastern United States, it's mostly tufted titmice, uh, but in the western part there are four or five other species that you can find. I'm most familiar with the black-capped chickadee, uh, which is the common species that occurs in the midwest of the United States. Um, we also have tufted titmice, which are adorable. Um, I actually was TA for an ornithology course during grad school, and we did a uh, mist netting and bird banding lab, and so I actually got to hold one of these little guys, and it was very cute. Holding a bird is kind of a wonderful experience. They're very soft and warm, uh, and they feel super fragile, and so it's sort of an anxious experience, 
Um, a lot of birds, when you hold them, uh, my sense is that they just think to themselves, like, well, I guess I'm dead now, and they just sort of stop moving, which is helpful, but kind of sad. Chickadees are not like that. Chickadees are pretty feisty. Um, I got to hold this one and spent, like, literally several minutes just chewing on my cuticle, and actually really hurt. I mean, they have quite a strong bill, despite how small it is, um, so it's kind of like being attacked by someone with safety scissors. They're not shy, especially if there are feeders around or if you're in an area where people habitually feed birds. Um, chickadees will get right up in your face and be like, where's the bird seed? They are present year-round and you will see them just puffed up like almost spherically in the winter uh, because feathers are really good insulating material and they're just trying to stay warm, but they're especially cute when they're yeah, puffed up and round. So, Chickadees are a wonderful example of birds that are named through onomatopoeia, which means they are named after the sound that they make. Uh, chickadees are known for having this scolding call where they say chickadee dee dee, and I'll find a recorded example and edit it in here. That is a call. Uh, it's not their song. Their song is learned and so it varies between species and between individuals within a species but it's typically kind of a whistled note uh, one high and then a few lower notes uh, and I'll edit in an example here cool that's known as the Phoebe song uh, although Phoebe is another example of a bird that's named after a song it makes okay I'm going to move on to talking about the wine in just a minute but by way of transitioning, I would like to leave you with this quote by Aldo Leopold from his book A Sand County Almanac. He's talking about banding chickadees in Wisconsin in order to study their annual survival, and he's talking about one particular chickadee that seemed to survive longer than other members of its cohort. And he says, I can only speculate on why 65290 survived his fellows. Was he more clever in dodging his enemies? What enemies? A chickadee is almost too small to have any. That whimsical fellow called Evolution, having enlarged the dinosaur until he tripped over his own toes, tried shrinking the chickadee until he was just too big to be snapped up by flycatchers as an insect, and just too little to be pursued by hawks and owls as meat. Then he regarded his handiwork and laughed. Everyone laughs at so small a bundle of large enthusiasms. Isn't that great? Okay, on to the wine. So let's talk about the wine a little bit. Like I said, this is a rosé, and rosé is kind of an interesting category because it defies the usual, uh, the easiest division within wine is red or white, and rosés are kind of neither. So what is a rosé? Um, rosé is a type of wine. It's not a type of grape, uh, like Chardonnay is. Rosé is wines that have a little bit of pigment and other compounds derived from the skin of grapes, but not enough to qualify as a red wine. So when you're making wine, you start with grapes, you press those grapes to release the juice, and that produces a, uh, a mass of both juice and smashed up skins and seeds and potentially stems and other parts of the plant. If you're making white wine, you want to start with the juice alone, and so you want to separate the juice from all the solid stuff as soon as possible. If you're making red wine, you leave the juice in contact with the skins as it ferments. And as the juice ferments, the yeast is converting sugar into alcohol, which is the part of wine that we all know and love. And alcohol is a very good solvent, and so as the alcohol sits in contact with the grape skins, it leaches out various compounds that are in the skins and the seeds and the stems. Uh, and fermentation also produces quite a bit of heat, and that heat just uh, helps the alcohol uh, extract those compounds. Some of those compounds are flavor related, so like tannins are part of what makes red wine uh, sort of dry your mouth out. Uh, others are related to color. So there's a class of compounds that are found in grape skins. They're called anthocyanins, 
and those are responsible for the sort of blue or purple color that's in grape skins, but they're also responsible for blue and pink and purple colors in various flowers, fruits, leaves. Um, lots of plants produce these, and if you are making rosé wine, there's a couple of ways to do it. One is that you keep the juice in contact with the skins for just a little while, so you keep them in contact for a period of hours, whereas the full fermentation process might take weeks or months, um, but you just keep them in contact just long enough to leach out a little bit of those pigments, uh, and that gives it this kind of nice pinkish color. Probably can't see that super well, but yeah, it's definitely not a white wine. Rosé is typically not the result of just mixing red and white wine together, and in some countries like France that's actually illegal. Uh, except in certain regions where it's a recognized part of the winemaking process, but it's definitely frowned upon in most of the world. So what is this rosé? Having established what rosé is, what is this rosé? So, like I said, it's from Chile. It's called Natura. This winery is very big on how sustainable and organic they are, uh, and that's really the bulk of information on this wine label is about uh, purity and naturalness and uh, all these nice sounding uh, terms that don't ultimately mean that much in my opinion. Uh, they also say made with organic grapes. That is actually a quirk of uh, US uh, food and drug labeling laws. If you want to market wine as organic wine, it has to not only be made from organically grown grapes but the winemaking process itself is also regulated. So if you want to market an organic wine, you cannot add any additional sulfites beyond what are produced in the winemaking process naturally. Um, sulfites have been used for ages by winemakers as just a preservative. Um, if they're used judiciously, they're not noticeable in terms of flavor and they have no harmful effects, but uh, just because of labeling requirements in the United States. You can't have added sulfites if you want to label it as organic. You have to label it as made with organic grapes. And you can make wine without adding sulfites to it, but it just tends to have a much shorter shelf life, and so there are definitely disadvantages to doing that. The rear label of this wine uh, kind of drives me nuts because they have a lot of sort of ad copy about the wine and they have the various warnings that are required by law, like if you're pregnant, don't drink wine. In terms of what to expect when you actually drink this wine, there's very little. Uh, there's very little information about what it's supposed to taste like or when you should drink it or what kind of food you might want to have with it. And, you know, I don't need all that information, but it is helpful to have. And instead they have kind of a lot of what I would call platitude-based marketing about how pure this wine is and about how good you can feel about drinking it. Let me just read this off. <clears throat> Premium and pure, it's that simple. Natura wines are made from the purest grapes nature can provide and with the utmost respect for the environment so you can feel good about sharing and enjoying. Like, that's it. What does any of that mean? What I dislike about it, what bothers me about it, is that it kind of assumes that I'm going to be drinking wine anyway. Um, it sort of treats wine as a commodity, something that you're just going to need regardless, and so your ultimate choice is between various wines, and rather than give you information about the taste of the wine, or uh, what it might be like to enjoy it, um, they're just saying, like, you don't have to feel bad about enjoying this wine, which suggests that I should feel bad about enjoying other wine. I don't know what kind of nefarious stuff they're alleging takes place at other wineries. I should point out that most people's wine buying decisions are not super rigorous. My understanding is that most people basically decide what kind of wine they want, and that can be as simple as red or white, and then they figure out what price point they're comfortable with, and at that point, it's pretty much you go to the liquor store and whatever label grabs your eye is what wine you're going to buy. I am clearly a consumer who responds positively to 
bird art on my wine labels, um, but other people respond to different things, so I assume this winery has done their market research and figured out what percentage of potential customers will respond positively to this, you know, natural, organic, uh, rah-rah type marketing. I'm a little skeptical. So there's very little information about the wine itself and what it should be like is the point that I'm trying to make. And I kind of agree with that approach because I've had a few glasses of this now and I have to say it pretty much just tastes like wine to me. Um, there's not a lot more depth to it than that. And that's okay. I mean, you don't always, you're not always looking for a rich or profound experience with wine. Some wine is just made to be simple and tasty. Yeah, the whole emotional slash moral appeal rubs me the wrong way, I guess. And that's just me. Like I said, it's fine. It's tasty. I would drink more of it. So that's all I have for this time. Uh, again, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time. I am Zach, and this has been Drinking About Birds.